go. Um, and I want to welcome you all tonight. Thank you so much. This program was at, um, requested by one of our patrons and glad they're here tonight and did this suggestion for us. Um, Anna Wallingford has been doing these talks for a long time. She is um, from UNH and an extension specialist in entomology and integrated pest management. She um, will give her talk tonight. It'll be about 20 or 25 minutes with slides and then we'll stop and have time for any questions and comments. If you do wanna put things in the, um, the chat box right away, you're so welcome to do that, but we'll wait to have the conversation until after Anna's presentation. So take it away, Anna, thank you all. Well, thank you so much for having me. And I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. This would be the time that I'd start handing out my pin specimens for you to take a look at and hand around. Um, like, like, like was said before, I'm gonna do just maybe 20 minutes of prepared um, remarks um, because I like to think about people who are just starting and people who are a little bit more advanced. So we'll have some time for some prepared remarks and then we'll have some time for questions because I know some of you are kind of varsity level gardeners for sure. So this might be a little boring for you. But just so you know, my background is in pest management of horticultural crops, fruits, vegetables, you know, small fruits, apples, things like that. I do a lot of research to find new and unique ways to avoid crop loss to insects. Um, sometimes it's by killing insects, but sometimes it's by manipulating their behavior. Um, so I also have a, a huge part of my job is teaching commercial growers how to manage pests in their fruit and vegetable crops. So a lot of the information I have um, might pertain more to commercial growers, but I've given a little talk today to kind of put this into something that will be helpful to anybody, no matter what you're growing or where you're growing. Um, obviously, most of my expertise is in vegetable crops, so that's going to be where a lot of the examples are. I'm going to share my screen and um, open up my PowerPoint presentation. So here's my email address. If you want to give me an email, it's just anna.wallingford at unh.edu, and I'm sure there can be some follow-up there. But what I will highly suggest to you all is to write this email down first, answers at unh.edu. This is a group of people at the Ed Center in Goffstown, New Hampshire. There's master gardener volunteers, there's experts, there's people who can connect to experts, you know, all around the state and all around the world. And if you have a weird question, go ahead and write to answers or give them a call. Um, they also have a Facebook page, a Twitter page, Instagram page. They do awesome Facebook live events that are kind of like this one. Um, and if you haven't already, subscribe to their newsletter, Grant State Gardening. It's going to be really useful. And new now is the Grant State Gardening podcast. So this is basically just an audio version of the newsletter. Um, if you are a fan of Nate and Emma's live events they've done on Facebook, go and Google Grant State Gardening podcast. You can listen to it right off of our website. Or if you have a podcatcher on your phone or listen to Spotify, you can find it on Spotify too. So my job is to teach the public about what integrated pest management is. So I absolutely have to teach you about what integrated pest management is. It sounds obvious enough. It's like an integrated approach to pest management, but there's actually a philosophy behind it. Um, in a nutshell, it's a strategic approach to avoiding crop loss that integrates knowledge of pest biology with all sorts of crazy and creative and interesting control methods. Um, typically we consider um, all these cultural controls, physical controls and biological controls before we consider chemical controls. Usually pesticides are a last ditch effort within this philosophy, but all these things are kind of used equally to avoid crop loss. So to avoid um, losing what's valuable and important to you. Um, that being said, we do offer a service because the first step in IPM is proper identification. So before you take any action, you have to understand what's causing the problem and how bad the problem is. So, you know, contact answers at unh.edu. Sometimes a photo can, you know, they'll be able to tell you right away or they'll say, I don't know what that is. You're probably gonna have to send in a specimen, but UNH does offer a service. So if you are stuck, you cannot figure out what's causing a problem, contact one of us and we can help you figure that out. 
Oh, answers. It's a great service. They'll get back to you a lot faster than I can. Um, so something I like to talk about a lot when I talk about IPM is acceptable levels. So before I said the goal of it is to avoid crop loss or avoid losing the thing that's valuable to you. So you always kind of have to think about what's valuable. Like the best example I can think of is if you're thinking of mice in your house, your acceptable level of mice in your house is probably zero mice, right? But in a different situation, maybe in your barn, your threshold for mice in your barn might be a little bit higher. So, you know, in your house, you would take out all the tools in your IPM toolbox to reach that zero mice level in your house. But in your barn, maybe you'd be more open to a biocontrol like a cat. And, you know, you'd be less worried about getting that threshold down to zero. So a lot of times we think about, you know, what are the acceptable number of bugs in your house? That's usually much lower than acceptable number of bugs on roses. So like bugs that cause top problems and something that you grow because it's beautiful and the beauty of it is valuable to you. And that would be different than the acceptable number of bugs on your tomatoes, because in a lot of circumstances, you can have bugs in the leaves, eating the leaves. And as long as it doesn't bother the fruit, you let those bugs go, right? Not a big deal. So monitoring. This is a huge, huge part of IPM. So you have to know who's causing the problem, what's causing the problem, how serious is the problem, and then most of the interventions that you would use in pest management, acting early is usually the best. So monitoring is what we mean by just paying attention to the health of that plant, seeing what's what's going on around it. And this is done in a couple different ways. Scouting is a term we use for just looking at the plants, right? So you're turning plants over, you're looking at it. Sometimes you're using some kind of magnification to look and see what is what is what it is feeding on that plant. So just Every once in a while, taking a look at the other side of the plant to see if anything weird's going on. Weather models, this is something that's really, really important in commercial agriculture. They have, um, you know, weather stations all around the state that give you an indication of when to do this, that, and the other thing. But for us, like, there's a lot of degree day calculations out there. So if you know you always have these leaf miners showing up in your, um, your beets or your spinach, and you wanna, you wanna cover up those plants, but you don't wanna cover up the whole season, there's weather models, there's degree days that can say, this amount of weather, this amount of degree days, this is when these flies will start flying. Just protect the plants for as long as they're flying and then you can uncover them. So a little bit of knowledge about the development of that insect can go a long way in that, in that circumstance. Trapping, this is just another easier way of scouting. Rather than going and look at the plants, you have some kind of device that you can check on a regular basis in order to see what's going on in your environment. So spotted wing drosophila, this is a new invasive pest that is a pest of small fruits like blueberries, raspberries, and things like that. Um, but for half of the season, the very beginning of the season, the, lo the levels of this pest are so, so low, the population hasn't grown yet. Most of the time you can grow fruit, no problem, no risk of flies. Later on in the season, the population grows and you have a higher risk. In order to know exactly when that happens, you would set out traps and check the traps rather than have to go and look at night where the flies are flying around the fruit. Regional reports. This is something we rely on really heavily in commercial agriculture. Um, things like potato leafhopper that actually live in the south. They live in the Gulf states. They cannot overwinter here. It's too cold up here in New Hampshire. So they actually fly up here every year, die. And the ones that make it back south, or the ones that stay in the south, fly back up. So we have friends in Maryland, in Long Island, that say, hey, well, they're coming. And that's when we get out and we start scouting for them. Um, there's also regional reports of monitoring networks. So pests of sweet corn, New Hampshire's UNH, UNH UNH Extension has a sweet corn pest monitoring program. You can go online and see what's going on in your area. There's a few towns, especially down in the southern parts of, of the state, where you can say like, oh, I, I want to know what's happening for corn borer and like um, the, little, the little worms that get into your sweet corn so you can protect those ears when there's a lot of insect activity around. Cultural controls, this is probably the thing that you all have the most control over. This basically means how you grow your plants, right? So if you have nice, healthy, vigorous growing plants, um, they can really tolerate a lot of damage. So if you're in a situation where like you're not that concerned about what the plants look like, you're just concerned about the fruit, this is really, really important. And always keep in mind that whatever is above ground is mirrored by what's below ground. So nice, healthy, 
root system and give that lots of space that you'll get a nice big canopy below. Um, a lot of the times these street trees are a good example of stress showing up because their roots are limited and there's a lot of heat bouncing off of these situations. So, you know, in potted plants, you have to irrigate potted plants a lot more than you think. Um, a stress plant can be a beacon for pest problems. So irrigation might be a thing to consider if you're trying to, to grow a plant in a stressed out area. Um, nutrition is super, super important so that you don't have deficiencies and have weird things going on. Planting and harvesting is super important when it comes to um, vegetable crops because you have a lot more control of, over that. So if you know that fly is flying and it's only flying in, in April, wait until June to plant that crop. Or I know a few people who don't plant potatoes in the spring because of Colorado potato beetle. They wait until Colorado potato beetle has gone into kind of a lull state, like they, they have a little dip in population. They plant then to make sure that it's not at, at a bigger risk to Colorado potato beetle. And of course, sanitation is a big thing from year to year. If you have an outbreak, make sure to get rid of that material, um, chop it up, um, compost it. Some people use solarization. I think I have a slide with a picture of solarization. So reducing any kind of infestations that happen so it doesn't become a bigger problem year after year. So prevention and sanitation, this is just avoiding the introduction of new pests. I think the biggest thing that we think about is weed seed and compost. So the, the one of the, the most amazing things about compost is that a properly composted compost has enough heat generated that it kills most of the weed seeds, it kills most of the pathogens, and, and that's an important part of composting. So if you're getting your compost from somebody else, or you, know, you have some on your property that you've been composting, but you're not really sure if it's hot enough or if it's, if it's aged enough, um, you might think about getting like a temperature to report some temperatures and see if that's gonna be something that reduces those weed seeds. Um, exclusion is a big, big part of prevention um, and destruction of infested material, like I was just saying, sanitation. So burying, solarization and composting. Um, I know there's a lot of people who are looking at tarping as a way to get rid of um, weeds before you plant something. If you use a clear surface, sometimes this can do a good number on any kind of soil dwelling pest. So um, if you are going from sod into vegetables, right? So if you're getting rid of your lawn and you're planting a vegetable crop, chances are kind of good that you have some grubs living in there. So that might be something to think about if you're going from a lawn into a vegetable crop. Physical controls by this good old squishing and flicking is one of my favorite physical controls. I know a lot of people who have some kind of doohickey full of soapy water that you're flicking those bugs off your plants and you can flush that stuff down the toilet or throw it in the compost pile. It's not dangerous, it's just gross. Um, exclusion, by this we're really talking about um, some kind of physical exclusion. So here's that cheap old Rime stuff. This is laid over some some seeds that are being started here and of course we have um, hoops that you can put remay over this right here is insect netting so it's got a little bit more air flowing through it but you see that that stuff is tucked in really nicely there's a nice seal where that dirt's going up over it so a lot of organic vegetable crops are started every single thing with a cover so that nothing can get in kale and clay this is one where some people might consider this to be um, a, a chemical control because you spray it like a chemical control. But what it really is, is this powder. You can spray it on plants. And what it does is create this kind of coat of fine particulate matter. And how it actually works is it acts to physically deter insects. So I kind of put this under physical controls. So it interferes with the visual cues that insects use to locate their host. First of all, they have a hard time finding it because they don't recognize that as, you know, I think this is a squash plant here. Um, and also if it does land on the surface, it gets this clay and, it's, and, it get, and it doesn't like it and it starts grooming it or it flies away, it doesn't like it, right? So this is a material that can be sprayed on, but I know a lot of cucurbit growers, so squash, pumpkins and things like that, that just go ahead and dip their whole transplants. Like this bucket is full of a slurry of this, the, the trade name is Surround. And this is something you could think about doing just to start your plants off, because especially for cucurbits, for example, one of the, um, the key pests of cucurbits is cucumber beetle. But with pumpkins, 
winter squash, like really hardy squash plants, a little bit of cucumber beetle feeding is not a big deal, especially once you get past those true leaves. So like those first true leaves. So the stage that this plant's at, once it grows past this, you kind of don't worry about cucumber beetle, but you do want to protect those young plants. So protecting young plants or protecting plants when they're most susceptible is a huge part of considering um, how, how you're going to approach your IPM program. Oh, and an added bonus of kaolin clay. This is counterintuitive um, because it looks like you're blocking light. So you'd think this would get in the way of photosynthesis, photosynthesis, but in most cases, it actually moderates the temperature on that leaf surface and it, and it helps vigor, right? So this, this, is a, this is an added bonus and not a negative. So biological control, um, we typically talk about biological control, which is using any living organism to do the dirty work for you to go out there and hunt and destroy your pests. We usually think about it in two different ways, either conservation biocontrol or augmentation biocontrol. So conservation just means saving everybody who already lives there, right? So you're protecting your existing natural enemies, which is the the predators and pathogens that go after your pests. So you're avoiding disruption. So this is part of the whole um, use chemical pesticides only when necessary as a last ditch. That's saying avoid disruption of natural enemies, um, avoid disruption of natural habitats, things like that. Um, you can also provide alternative habitats, so things that uh, have flowering crops, so the pollen and the nectar in flowering crops, and sometimes just keeping things a little tiny bit weedy can be beneficial. So like not a super, super sloppy weeding, such a, but you don't have to be super, super clean because any flowering plant can provide pollen and nectar to the little parasitoids and predators that go after your pests and that can help them with their success. Um, however, you can't go beyond quote unquote natural levels. So you're dealing with what's living there. Um, this is a natural, um, a natural situation, but sometimes pests kind of have a, a higher population than, than normal. Because if you think about it, if you're growing a vegetable garden, you're growing a lot of something this insect really loves. And you're growing, you know, more than would grow there if nature had its way, right? So there's an option, you can add biocontrols to your system, and this is augmentation biocontrol. So you're gonna bring in new predators, parasitoids, but don't forget about entomopathogens and entomopathic nematodes. So these little tiny nematodes use a combination of hunting and they actually carry an entomopathogen with them that helps them kill their prey. I don't know if you've heard about entomopathic nematodes, but they're quite powerful for soil dwelling pests. Um, so the idea of augmentation biocontrol is to introduce new natural enemies into your system, but you're overwhelming your pest population. So your unnaturally high pest population, you're meeting them with an unnaturally high amount of their natural enemies. I know there's a lot of using the word natural, but that's the idea. So a few of the usual suspects, I want to just make sure that you're recognizing these, these major players that are probably already living in your garden. You'll know late Asian lady beetle. Um, this is the one that was introduced on purpose a few times throughout history. So back in, um, I would say 1916, so more than 100 years ago, was the first purposeful release of this in California as a biocontrol for aphids. Um, the last purposeful release that USDA did was in the, nine, the 80s, I think. So, since then, we've realized that they are a little more trouble than they're worth because these are the ones that come into your house, right? So when they are ready to overwinter, when they realize in the fall that the sun's going down and it's getting cold, they look for what they think is a south-facing cliff with a nice warm south-facing cliff with cracks and crevices. It's actually your house, which means that they're good at getting inside those cracks and crevices and coming into your house. So that's a real pain for us. Um, these native lady beetles, so the way that you tell them apart is Harmonia, the Asian lady beetle has this M on its pronotum, so on its neck. Um, and that's how you can tell it from other species of lady beetles. This is one that we'll see pretty commonly. But they're both beneficial when they're in the garden. They're both good. One of them is just kind of a pest. But the real voracious player there is the offspring. This is the larvae of a lady beetle. These are the ones that really, really do a number on aphids. So if you have nice, healthy, happy, reproducing lady beetles in your house and you have these um, nymphs running around, you're, you're not going to have an aphid problem for very long. Some other ones that are kind of interesting, these are hemipterans. These are bugs. 
that are predators. So this one looks a lot like that brown marmorated stink bug that comes into your house, but this is a native, we call it pedisis. This is called the spine soldier bug. So you can tell it has these little spines on its shoulders, if you can see that. Some species, like they're kind of ooh, pointy, but they will hunt lots of different things. This is actually a really important um, predator for Colorado potato beetles, so that pest of potatoes we just talked about. And here, this is a really blown up picture. This is something we call a minute pirate bug. This is a tiny, tiny bug, but it hunts thrips aphids, all sorts of things like this. This is a really important predator in greenhouse settings. Here's a couple other kind of weird ones you might see in the garden. And now that I've shown you a picture of it, I bet you a dollar you'll see them this, this summer. So if you turn over a leaf and you see these eggs that are like kind of on long stalks, I don't know if you've ever seen these before, those are lacewing eggs. So the adult right here, it's called lace wings, it's got these lacy wings. The adults just eat, eat nectar and flower, uh, you know, pollen and things like that. But the offspring, the larvae are super, super voracious. So the things that hatch out of these weird stalks, they lay them on those weird stalks to keep them away from other predators. So you'll see other predators kind of walking through these trees of lace wing eggs and they don't, they don't know what's going on. There's these eggs above them, they don't know. But these eat aphids, they eat thrips, things like that. They're really important. Um, this right here is a hoverfly. You might have seen this before. It looks a little bit like a bee. Um, to me, I'm looking at this and this fly has two wings <laughs> and bees have four wings. You might not know that. That might not be a dead giveaway if you see it in the garden, but the dead giveaway that's in the garden is if you see a fly flying backwards, a hoverfly is the only insect that can fly backwards. So if you're wondering if it's a bee or a fly and it's hovering around, you see it goes, that's a fly. That's a good guy, right? So Again, the adult just eats nectar and pollen, but the offspring are voracious aphid predators and they are really, really active. And this is actually the way that I tell the difference between like regular old maggots and a predatory maggot is that this, this, this maggot is moving, right? And it's hunting aphids. And so these adults will find aphid colonies, lay their children there and they'll go to town. So these all exist in your garden. A couple of weird ones that you will probably encounter. So you might have noticed this if you've ever had hornworms in your tomatoes. Actually, honestly, if you've ever had hornworms in your tomatoes, you probably see the poops first. So they have these like weird cube shaped poops, right? So you'll find these weird square poops on the ground and then you look up and you realize half of your tomato plant's been eaten, eaten by this honking hornworm, which is named after a hornworm because it has a horn on its tail. But a, a lot of people have had an experience where they've grabbed it, they wanted to show it to somebody or something, and then all of a sudden all these like little squirmy things come out of it and these cocoons are formed. That's actually a parasitoid wasp has laid its eggs you know, previously, and those larvae developed inside that larvae for a while, right? So that that hornworm keeps eating your tomato and the larvae of this wasp develop and all of a sudden they pop out and they pupate and then they go on to do the same thing. So if you find this, that's a good thing in your garden, right? Another example of a parasitoid, this, we all know this is a Japanese beetle. I don't know if you've ever noticed this before, but there's sometimes these white little eggs on its, on its back, right? This is a parasitoid egg. It's actually a fly that comes and lays its eggs on Japanese beetle and other scare beetles, other beetles in this family. Those eggs hatch out, they burrow into the beetle and they, you know, make a meal of it. So they don't do a good enough job of knocking back Japanese beetle populations as much as you might like, but anytime you see this, you should feel, feel pretty good about that. <laughs> All right, has anybody ever seen these before? If you have an aphid outbreak in your lettuce or your spinach or anything like that, you turn it over, you're like, oh no, <laughs> there's an aphid outbreak. But you see these big blown up little characters here. They're, these are called aphid mummies. This is another sign of parasitism. And like, you can even see that there's a perfect circle right here. That's where a wasp has already hatched out. They cut a perfect circle. So um, you have a wasp that's come along. She's stuck her ovipositor right inside that aphid, laid her baby inside there. It developed in the aphid. And then later on, uh, another wasp comes out of that aphid instead of another aphid. So you might see this. Um, a lot of the time, this is kind of, it's too late for this aphid population. You're probably going to have to do something else, but it is good to see these, these parasitoids doing their work. 
couple of examples of stuff that you can add. So we went through a few things that you might encounter, you know, just nature doing its thing. So Bacillus thuringiensis, this is a bacterium that is um, only toxic to insects. It's actually a gut poison. So that's one example of an entomopathogen. You can spray it like a pesticide, but it's it's a biocontrol, right? It's only going to make insects sick. Milky spore is another example. This is very specific. This is only for Japanese beetle. So most strains of Bacillus thuringiensis that, are, that make caterpillars sick wouldn't make a beetle sick, but milky spore is just for Japanese beetles. Um, there's tons of companies that focus on selling you predators. They usually come in, you know, some kind of carrier. This might be like some wheat germ or something, but you can see in that picture, they're teeny, teeny, tiny animals. These photos are blown up. These are predatory mites. So they eat other mites. They eat um, thrips, pupae, things like that. Um, minute bi pirate bugs, the ones I just showed you, you can buy those. Aphelides, these are flies. So it's kind of similar to that hoverfly. They'll lay their eggs where aphids are and their offspring will eat them. Lacewing larvae, you can purchase those. Um, lady beetles are harder to get a hold of depending on what kind of time of year. If you can get them, they're pretty, they're pretty good. Rove beetles, these are really, really great for soil dwelling pests as well as entomopathic nematodes. So they're not going to help you with anything above ground, but if you have a hard to control below ground pest. Um, and there's a few species of wasp you can buy, but they're usually pretty specific to what they're targeting. So a few examples, it really depends on what you, what kind of problems you have. So identifying your problem and finding the right tool for it. Chemical controls. Like I said, Chemical controls are part of IPM, right? So we usually only like to use them when they're absolutely necessary. But in general, the chemical controls that are at your beck and call as somebody who just kind of walks into a big box store or a hardware store kind of fall under three different categories. One is soap, salts, and oils, which I will argue is not really a chemical control. It's probably a physical control, but I'll explain. Gut poisons, so things that make insects sick when they eat the material, so either as a bait or if they're eating your plant um, and they eat that and they get sick, and then we have some neurotoxins. So we'll cover what you, what you can actually encounter. Um, but before we do that, we do have to talk about pesticide safety. So if you're using any kind of pesticide, you have to think about the ways it can, can get into you and bother you. Um, obviously, oral ingestion is going to be dangerous, but don't forget about dermal, uh, dermal, dermal contact. So we always recommend using long rubber gloves. Um, don't use cloth gloves when you're using pesticides. Goggles are always a good idea. I'm lucky I kind of come ready made with my glasses, so I don't have to worry about it too much. And inhalation, we're not going out there using a respirator. You can't get your hands on anything that would require a respirator, but you know, a mask wouldn't hurt. And you know, these days we have plenty of masks hanging around. So that's good news for us IPM specialists. Um, so soap, salts, and oils. The reason I consider these to be more of a physical control than a chemical control is because they kill insects by physically harming them. They're smothering them. So I don't know if you know this, but insects breathe through the holes in the sides of their bodies. They have something called spiracles. So they'll have several holes on the sides of their body, which is how they breathe. So in order to smother an insect with soapy water or soaps or oils or something like that, you'd have to coat the entire insect in order to smother it. Another way that these products work is that they'll kind of interfere with the skin of the insect, and that makes the, the skin of the insect break down and the insect suffers and dies. Um, again, this is not a, chem a chemical control. I mean, it's soap. If you get it in your eye, it would bother you, but other than that, you don't have to worry about it. It's pretty harmless. But the caveat is you cannot control insects inside plants or below ground, um, and it doesn't affect insects walking across treated surfaces, so it's safe for your predators. Um, so there's some, some good news and some bad news, but the way to make this work is to completely coat that insect. It works best on immature insects that have soft bodies um, before they get to be adults, so something to keep in mind. Oh, and I feel like I have to bring this up too, because I know that neem products are very popular now. Um, something that you absolutely must know about neem oil. So there's a couple of different products, like very, very different products that you can get your hands on. There's cold pressed neem, and there's a product called clarified neem. So if you look at this bottle over here, and you look down in the bottom corner, if you could actually read it, it would say clarified neem oil, right? So this one, cold pressed neem, this is just the raw product from the neem tree. 
that this neem tree evolved this um, terrific defense mechanism against insect pests. So not only does it interfere with the growth of the insect pests that come and eat it, but the insect pests that eat it realize that this is no good for them and that there's a little bit of anti-feeding. Um, and that's because of a, a chemical called azadiractin. Um, so this raw product, they've squeezed the seeds of this neem tree. So the oil, the lipid is coming out. There's some other botanical compounds, like the things that make it smell like plant tissue. And there's a little bit of this azadiractin in it. Because it's a raw product, you don't really know how much azadiractin is in it. You don't, not, you don't really know what's in that, right? <laughs> so um, another thing to keep in mind is that this oil needs a little bit of warming. I don't know if you've ever put olive oil in the fridge and it gets a little solidified, that's the same deal with this raw product. Um, but there's lots of unknowns here. So this is not a product that's registered for use. Commercial growers could not use this legally. They'd have to get something that was registered by the EPA. And there are plenty of products that are, they're just a little bit more expensive. Um, this is compared to clarified neem. The azadiractin has actually been removed from clarified neem. That doesn't mean it's not useful because in that product, you still have the lipid and you still have the botanical odors. So that lipid is acting the same way that a soap or a salt would, that you're smothering the insect, but you do have to completely coat the insect and you have to act early and you have to act often, works best on immature insects. That azadiractin is not in there. So that, that growth regulation, you're not getting that with the over-the-counter clarified bean product. Um, this is a regular, regulated material, so you know it's not going to cause phytotoxicity on your plants. It's not going to, there's not going to be any surprises with this guy. Um, but I will say it's probably not more effective to control insects than a horticultural oil. So comparing a clarified neem oil to a horticultural oil, it's kind of like, would you rather use a petroleum product or not a petroleum product? And that's really up to you. I don't actually don't think there's much of a difference in price either. So take that for what it's worth. So moving along into our different categories, we have gut poisons, dipel, anything that has BT in it is gonna be something that's really selective, only toxic to a certain groups of, group of insects. So this product is only toxic to caterpillars. It won't kill bugs, it won't kill beetles, it won't kill anything but anything that Lepidopteran family. There are other BT products that are specific to other groups. Like I know that there is a biocontrol that you can put into say, um, if you have a pond or a water feature in your yard, and you're worried about it becoming a mosquito haven. There is a different species of BT that you can purchase specifically for mosquito larvae. So that's something to think about if you don't want to create a mosquito haven in your yard. And it's a different kind of BT than this. Um, another gut poison that's used all the time is boric acid. This is the active ingredient in most liquid amphates. So they'll mix boric acid with sugar. They can't get enough of it because it's sugar and that boric acid, you know, makes them sick. They have a tummy ache and they can't, they can't handle it and they die. So those are two really, really common examples. So we'll get into a little bit of the, the neurotoxins that you can get a hold of. So pyrethrins and pyrethroids. So pyrethrin is derived from a natural product. They're actually these daisies. And so this is a really, really commonly used product in commercial um, horticulture. And there's a picture of a daisy on it because it's actually from dried up. Um, it's not the daisies that we have, like that you can purchase at the grocery store or the florist. It's a special kind of chrysanthemum that has high concentration of this pyrethrin. Um, and most products um, that are the pyrethroids, just synthetic versions of the pyrethrins. Basically, we said this works great, but it doesn't last very long. The reason that organic systems love pyrethrins is that they're effective, but they degrade really quickly in sunlight. So you can use a pyrethrin in the garden, and by the end of the day, it's toast. It's broken down into something that's completely safe. A pyrethroid is a synthetic version of that. So chemists have figured out how to make a similar chemical that lasts a little bit longer in the field and can hold up in sunshine for maybe a day or two longer, right? Here's one product that is super, super important when it comes to protecting yourself from ticks. So this is a pyrethrin. 
So anything that ends in thrin, it's a dead giveaway that you're talking about pyrethrins or pyrethroids. So this is probably a delta methrin or a permethrin. These are products that you can apply to your clothes. So unlike DEET, which is a repellent, which just confuses insects, it's not toxic. This material is actually toxic and it, it works as a repellent because an insect will land on, you know, treated clothes, feel a little sick and fly away. So this is a really nice way to have uh, mosquitoes avoid you, ticks avoid you, things like that. So all these products will vary in toxicity. If you look at the active ingredient, you know, look for pyrethrin or delta methrin or lambda cyhalethrin, and that's a dead giveaway that you're talking about one of these chemicals. Again, they usually break down really quickly, but when you're using them, you do have to worry about contact um, to your skin. You don't want to get this material on your skin for a very long time. If you're wearing gloves, that's great. Take the gloves off, wash up after you're using it. Um, the products that you can get your, hand, your hands on are really low, low, low toxicity. We are terrific at breaking these down. We have a really good metabolism, so they're safe to use in moderation. Spinosins. This is another naturally derived toxicant. Um, they, they are neurotoxins. Um, they're derived from this, um, this microbe that they found in the soil of a rum distillery. So if you, if you look at this product right here, it's got a picture of like a cool island guy. The active ingredient, if you look really close with the active ingredients is spinosad. Um, this is one of these materials. So this is technically a neurotoxin, but this material works really well if it's eaten. So once this material is sprayed on a plant surface and it dries, it is absolutely safe for beneficials or anything else crawling over that treated surface. It really only makes the insects that eat that treated tissue get sick and die. Of course, while you're using it, you should be wearing gloves and protecting yourself from any kind of contact, but you should feel rest assured that this material breaks down quite quickly in sunlight. So if you apply this material, it usually only lasts for about a day on that treated surface. And this is the old standby. A lot of people will feel quite comfortable using seven dust. This is a carbamate. Um, commercial products have very, very low concentrations. So this is generally pretty safe to use, but again, rubber gloves, protect yourself, wash up after using this. Um, this is a broad spectrum pesticide that will kill um, what you're after and it can have some, some non-target effects. So this is probably not very IPM friendly, but effective um, if, if you have gotten to a situation where you can't, you can't have any, anything else work. So those are my prepared remarks. Um, please keep in mind that IPM programs are certainly, you know, cut and paste, whatever works for you, whatever fits within your philosophy, um, but I'm happy to take any questions. I have a question. Go ahead. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I'm wondering, I might have missed it because I joined a little late, but I live in southern Vermont and um, we had a really bad problem with cucumber beetles last summer. And I, I missed if you mentioned any, uh, you know, suggestions or advice of what to do about those. Mm -hmm. So cucumber beetles are super, super hard to control. They're little tanks. So even in conventional management, they can be kind of difficult, right? But I can tell you a couple of things I do know about them that may or may not be helpful for you. So these um, cucumber beetles, they overwinter as adults somewhere around in your, in your neighborhood, right? So around now, it becomes warm enough for them to fly around. They're actually, like once there's flowering plants, like they'll start eating pollen and nectar from like any old plant. Um, as soon as they are ready to settle down and start a family is when they try to find cucurbits. So they try to find your cucumbers, your melons, your pumpkins, your winter squash, and it, it's, they're kind of triggered by the odors of the plants and when the plants flower, so the floral odors, they love the floral odors, and they come and they, they land on your plants. So um, after they've you know, settled down and made a family, they lay eggs, those eggs hatch and then they go below ground. The larvae develop below ground. And then later on in the summer, you're like, oh my goodness, where'd these beetles come from? They came up right out of the ground. So keeping in mind that you have one moving in, one generation moves in from elsewhere and the other generation comes right up from the, from, from the uh, below ground. In the spring, putting a row cover over 
those plants does a really, really good job of protecting those plants from cucumber beetles. And if I were you, I would keep that row cover on for as long as you possibly can. So you're kind of maybe peeking under to see what the flowers look like. If you think about the flowers on most of these plants, they'll put out a couple male flowers before they start putting out female flowers. So keep those plants covered for as long as you can absolutely bear to. And that should do a pretty good job of keeping cucumber beetles off your plants. If you don't do that and you wait and you're like, oh, whoops, I, you have a cucumber beetle problem later, that row cover's not gonna do anything for you because they're coming up from below ground. Um, a couple other things to keep in mind about these beetles is that, you know, from a chemical control point of view, pyganic, like the, the pyrethroids, it kind of works okay. You can certainly do that. Um, spinosa does not work. Um, they, because spinosa needs to be consumed, these beetles, ironically, individually don't eat enough plant material for that, that to work. Um, something we're working on right now is playing around with um, feeding stimulants, right? So we're, we're taking some of these products that work really, really well, mixing it with something that they love. It's like this bitter um, cucurbitacin and, and trying to trap them. So there are a few different traps you can use and you can try to mass trap them. I actually would not advise that because currently the only lures that we have are floral lures because they love the smell of those flowers and the traps that they make are actually horrible bee traps too. So it kind of defeats the purpose. Um, I don't know if that helps. Oh, another, another tip that I've heard from somebody who works with cucumber beetles to keep in mind is they're the most active at night. So if you are a very brave soul and you have the energy and the chutzpah to go out and hand pick these beetles, don't waste your time in the middle of the day. Go out at night with a headlamp, then you'll get more bang for your buck if you're going to do that. Is that uh, helpful? Yeah, that's, that's very helpful. And, um, <laughs> And I agree with you that we tried some different sorts of traps last summer and we trapped, you know, friendly bugs and bees and we were sad about that. We did not want that to happen. So, well, hey, stay tuned for more on that because we are going to be playing around with these, um, these baits because the bitterness, the beetle, the cucumber beetles love it because it goes, ah, oh, like that's my host. I love that bitter taste. Like they're into it, but bees don't like it. Um, we, were, we were thinking about putting flowers maybe throughout. I didn't know like if that would be counterproductive. I mean, they might, they might stop and have a little snack on their way to your cucurbits. Uh, another thing to keep in mind, and this is something that um, people don't love to hear, is that um, on certain plants, especially pumpkins and winter squash, those plants can handle a lot of cucumber beetle feeding and, and yeah, you don't have actually... to worry about it. We actually, I mean, even though we had such an issue, it got worse as time went on, but we produced so many cucumbers and zucchini throughout even having the issues. It was, it was surprising, but it so was still so yeah. annoying. They wouldn't go away. <laughs> I mean, they're kind of gross, but if you're growing big, robust plants, then forget it. Let the cucumber reels have their bottle. But what I will say is with the cucumbers, if you have a wilt problem, that's another problem. So cucumber beetles will transmit the bacteria that causes cucumber wilt. So if you notice that you have nice irrigated plants and they're still like a little sad, that might be because you have wilt. If you have a really good eye for it, you can snap a branch off and stick them together and the, the glue will kind of stick together and that'll give you a sign that there's wilt in that plant. So it might not we be worth- have that issue as well, the wilt. Yeah, so cucumbers are really sensitive to it. Some melon species are really sensitive to it. Pumpkins and winter squash, they don't, they don't, they're not sensitive to it at all. But if you have a cucumber plant, that has those wilt signs, like it's definitely not an irrigation problem. It might be worth roguing that plant out and destroying it. Okay. Sadly. sadly. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Beth, you have your hand up. Yeah. Beth. I had a question in the chat also, uh, and this is not really so much for a garden, but how do you reduce wasps around your house and porch? I don't mind if they're outside, but they like to come inside. I guess it depends on what kind of wasp you're talking about, I know. right? No, big. Um, are you talking about like in the fall? Uh, well, it usually seems to start at the you know uh, August, mm -hmm. but you'll find little gray nests. I mean, I see them already around the house, and I can see them flying around the south side of things. So, and they in the winter they're sort of falling out of 
window frames and things and staggering around. So there's a lot of wasps here. Um, yeah. So here, here's what I can tell you. Well, I can't, I don't have any good news for you. I don't have a solution for you. But what I can tell you is that most wasp species that form those paper nests, their social structure is, is really different from other hymenopteran, so other bees. So if you think about honeybees, they have this family, they stick together, they overwinter together, they continue to grow from year after year. Wasp families are different, right? So every winter, most of the daughters that are grown in that colony will die from the winter, the winter temperatures. And the lucky ones go out and start their own nests. So they start establishing those nests early in the season, um, maybe like June or so. Um, and that's, they're kind of restructuring and they're finding new places. So by the time you realize there's a problem, it's like September because that nest has grown up and they've started bothering you because it's cold and your house looks great. And there's maybe some smells that they love that you're, I don't know, making hot dogs in the grill or something like that. But um, you might start thinking about scouting out earlier in the season to see if there's little nests um, going, kind of building away. And the best time to do something to get rid of those nests is at night because they go to sleep at night. So if you're going to use a physical method to get rid of those nests or a chemical method to get rid of those nests, like a lot of the over-the-counter stuff works pretty well, go out at night with your red headlamp because insects can't see red and you know, make sure someone who loves you knows what you're doing, you know, have a direct route to the, 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 the emergency room just in case, but that would be the way to do it when they're really small, but look for them earlier, because if you know you have a, a chronic problem, you're probably going to have one next year, too. What do you think about, um, uh, there are, like, traps that you're supposed to put a lure in and do it early in the spring, and the queen goes there, and, but, and we, we have caught a lot of, um, I don't know, exactly what kind of wasp they are, but you know, every month you kind of dump this out and refresh it. Is it the kind I that you like put a little bit of, you put a little bit of like lunch meat into? Much, much of what? Like a little bit of lunch meat. Do they have you put a little bit of lunch meat into the trap? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It comes in a packet and it smells kind of like acetone. Hmm. Uh, I'm not, of, yeah. I'm not, I don't familiar. know. I mean, I don't know if I'm just making more come there. Uh, and, you know, if I'm aggravating the problem, that's what I'm not sure about. It's, it's certainly possible because when I'm talking about Japanese beetles, that's where you have to be really careful. The odor that they sell in Japanese beetle traps is, oh, it's very powerful. I don't know about the wasps. I would bet you that you're not making the problem worse. Like, you, like the Hippocratic Oath, like do no harm. I think trying that out, I don't think it'll hurt you because I think there's something about your house that's very warm and inviting. So you're probably, you know, you're probably already pulling in any wasps that are living in your neighborhoods. I don't think that the oral, like the, the, that pheromone or whatever is in there is going to pull in like your neighborhood wasps. I think. I'll think about it. I'll get back to you if I can think of anything better. Um, Anna, there's another question in the comments um, that if cucumber beetles winter over under the ground and you put row covers on early, are you going to trap them in the area that they are? You've that's planted a, your cucumber. That's a really good question. And they will maybe overwinter in your plot if you keep your host plants there. Um, but if you're clearing out your host plants, like digging them up, burying them, pulling them out, composting them somewhere else, they are less likely to overwinter right there. These beetles are looking for what, what we look for in like an what we look for in overwintering habitat is usually like in the forest. If you think about like where there's nice leaf litter and it's nice protected, they like to overwinter right in the soil layer underneath like a bunch of organic matter. So there is a possibility that those beetles are overwintering in your garden plot, but probably not. Um, it's probably more likely that they're overwintering somewhere else and migrating into your garden every year. So, so maybe, but not, not so much. It's probably not a satisfying answer. <laughs> Um, I have a question. Um, my garden is plagued with um, flea beetles and they really, um, they can be pretty devastating to a lot of plants. And what, what kind of suggestions do you have? Well, you can stop growing brassicas for one, right? <laughs> so it's that actually, 
unlike the cucumber beetles that probably find somewhere else to overwinter, flea beetles are likely going to overwinter in your brassicas. Because I know a lot of people who love to overwinter brassicas. Like there's nothing more delicious than like like those winter greens that have gone through like a little bit of freeze. So like it's really hard not to overwinter brassicas. But something to think about. I know that a lot of commercial growers will have like a summertime quiescence where they completely eliminate brassicas and that's kind of like part of their rotation. So if you think about rotating crops, you kind of think about spatially rotating crops, but we also think about temporal rotation. So if you have a flea beetle problem that's out of control, you've done your best to kind of keep them out with grow cover or, um, you know, other ways of removing them and it's still out of control, you might just stop growing brassicas for a little bit. Um, and if that breaks your heart, maybe try to do a cool season in a fall and just like cool it in the summertime. That might help. Um, otherwise, um, there are there are a few methods that that I've been seeing out of UMass that have been really helpful. So not only are like um, row cover is really helpful if you have beetles moving in. Another thing that we, we do know is that um, the ground cover can be really helpful. So if you've ever seen these silver mulches that reflect light up, they really disorient insects that are moving into a crop because those insects, they, they think that light is coming from the sun and from above them, they orient themselves using the sun. And if their light comes, they think the light, that's the sun, and they fly away. So with reflective mulch, obviously, it's really easy to see that there'd be light coming out from the ground. This is also the case with a lot of the lighter colored mulches. So if you have um, like straw or like lighter colored, colored mulch, that can be helpful when insects are migrating in. But like you say, if those flea beetles are already in the ground, you're kind of, you're kind of stuck. We have quite a few Sorry. other questions. Karen, you want to go ahead with your hand raised? Hi, yes. Um, how do we deal with um, powdery mildew? I, I'm, I'm getting that a lot every season. And uh, I've tried a lot of the DYIs and they <laughs> just don't work. What, what have you tried? Uh, soap, oil, mm. you know, um, spraying, spraying that. Um, I really don't want to do pesticides if yeah. I can. Um, but I, I think last year my biggest problem was I planted them too close because I was trying to do vertical growing. Mm. Uh, so I'm going to let them spread out more this time this year. Yeah. But it's just, it's so disappointing because once it takes hold, you just can't stop it. Yeah. So you, you've already kind of said a couple things that I was going to say is that air is the, the, the finest of fungicides, right? Um, what kind of oil are you using for powdery mildew? Is it like a neem oil or something like that? Um, oh, I can't even remember. <laughs> like olive oil or something. I mean, it's just like... Oh, okay. Oh, I, don't know, I haven't heard of that before. Um, what else, what else could I recommend? Um, I, I, there are a few like varieties that are known for being a little bit more resistant to powdery mildew. I don't know those off the top of my head. I can find out, but you might try, you know, Googling varieties that are more resistant to powdery mildew. Air is super important. Airflow, um, starting out with really clean materials. Where are you getting transplants? Or are you starting from seed? Um, I have done both, but I am growing in raised beds. Hmm. So I have a, I have a mixture of um, compost, peat, perlite, uh, you know, plus slow release fertilizer. And how long does it take before the plants completely go down? Um, well, they're they're pretty good in you know June, July, August is like the killing month. And so like so much so that you're not getting any fruit out of it? Correct. Hmm. Well, I would I would say like maybe maybe make sure that you're that you're that you're grow like maybe check your nutrition, right? So if you have a nice robust plant, maybe it can grow through that infection. Okay. I mean, that would that would be my my best advice for you because if you're not wanting to use like a preventative fungicide to clean up those plants early, 
in the season that that might be saved by just having a really really robust plant. Um, so maybe maybe check your 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 nutrient or do a soil test or something like that to make sure that your plants are growing as well as they possibly can to fight your infection. Okay, I I have one really quick follow up question to that. Is um, I had read somewhere recently and I I don't recall where that if you're buying seedling starts from the box stores, you're probably introducing a lot of heartache to your garden in terms of pests that come, you know, in the soil and on the plants. Maybe. And I think um, the one that I would really worry about would be, we have been hearing a little bit of problems with um, broad mite coming in on pepper transplants. So that's one of those things where like, you grow a plant and it looks like a little twisty, but it's growing fine. And then all of a sudden the fruit come out and they've got like this weird leathery look to them. And like, it's just too late. Um, and it's, it's really hard to see if you have broad mites. That's a weird one. I would definitely <laughs> worry about that one, but there would be, it'd be kind of hard to tell there was a problem. Like, you know, like if you have twisty leaves, see the thing about it is like, like what you always want to do is know what a normal plant looks like and don't buy one that doesn't look like the normal plant. But if everybody looks weird, it's hard to tell, right? <laughs> but as far as the other stuff, I wouldn't worry too much about bringing in thrips or aphids. Thrips or aphids or like all the other stuff, it's already living in your garden, right? It's just when things get out of whack and the numbers get up. Um, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about that too, too, too much. Um, and like the weird soil borne diseases might be one to think about, but usually like these companies catch wind of problems and they're kind of taken out. You might hear in like a newsletter, like, oh yeah, you know, Joe Schmo's such and such had a bad seed borne, whatever, don't buy that this year, but they'll clean out their act next year. So there's a few circumstances, but I wouldn't worry too, too much about it. Okay. And we'll take another question from the chat and then we'll go to Jerry. Um, somebody asks, are there any suggestions besides hand picking for managing Japanese beetles? Japanese beetle on what? Are, we, are you trees. talking on fruit, fruit trees. trees? You're not going to want to hear this because the hardest thing to ask anybody to do is nothing. But I want you to consider the health and the size of the fruit tree before you worry too much about the damage that those beetles are causing because they are cause a lot of, they eat a lot of plant tissue. If you have a very young tree, that's something that you need to worry about. If you have a big mature tree, there's lots of foliage on it. Those beetles can eat like 25, 35, 45% of those, those leaves before the fruit quality or the fruit number is affected. So, I don't know if that's helpful or not. Um, one thing that that I do um, as part of <laughs> part of my regular entomological tools, I often am sampling bugs in order to bring them back to my lab and start a colony. So something that we do a lot is take a leaf blower, turn it around into a vacuum cleaner. We actually will use um, paint strainer bags on the end of that. You know, let it rip and suck the bugs off the plants, right? And I think Japanese beetle is something to consider there because the damage that you can cause an apple tree running a weird leaf blower over it, I don't think you could do that much damage. If you have a really delicate, like 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 peas or something, you wouldn't be wanting to run your leaf blower over it to suck bugs off of it. You could also be sucking good guys off too. But there's a few circumstances. I think cholera potato beetle might be one. Cucumber beetle, if you're into running a leaf blower at night, um, that might be something to think about. It's kind of cuckoo, but it's something we do all the time, but you have to kind of weigh how much damage you could cause versus how much damage the bug is going to cause. And ooh, as much as you hate seeing those Japanese beetles, you know, eat your beautiful tree, as long as it's a big, healthy, robust tree, let the baby have its bottle. It's probably not a satisfying answer. I'm really sorry. <laughs> Jerry, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, there's a problem that I've had just a couple of years and it had to do with kale and cabbage. And it was that so, all of a sudden a plant would look really kind of ill and I would look around and I, and I would look just beneath the surface of the ground and something was girdling the area, mm -hmm. but I did not find any, um, any um, cut worms mm -hmm. and it was not cut completely. It, it was basically like apple cored it and made it very narrow and it just wouldn't be able to recover. The one thing I did see a lot of were ants. 
But I didn't know if the ants were just there as saprophytes to clean up after something else caused damage or whether they were the primary injury itself. And I treated it initially with a lot of BT and also with uh, diatomaceous earth to just in case it was one of the um, uh, cut worms or something like that. That didn't seem to do it, but it was an inordinate number of ants right around the damaged ones. Were those ants just saprophytes coming to clean up or were they, do, can they girdle this? Because I it's, did use some of the ant traps. It's like you were eavesdropping into meetings we've had about this because this is the, the big question, these ants. So in most of these situations, we rule out damping off. We rule out any kind of fungal disease that caused that weird thinning that you're talking about. Um, we just assume these ants were following something, right? Yeah. But the more I'm reading about it, the more there's something going on. We do not know if these ants are eating the roots or if they're just making a house out of the roots and that's causing the plants to suffer. Um, but ant baits would work just fine. <laughs> I think that's, yeah, that's, like that's well did, justified. Was, yeah, I did that this last year and I seen that. How'd it go? Less, I had a lot less problem. I put it in prophylactically around mm -hmm. the area where I've had the trouble around the brassicas. Um, but and, and I was trying to identify, they were not like normal ants. They looked a bit more like a fire ant or something along mm. that line. And um, yeah, it was, and they're just quite distinctly girdled like an apple core. And so is so, this in a tunnel? Is this in like extended season or is this out in open culture? No, it's just out, this is out during regular season. This is fascinating to me because the first time somebody described this to me, I was like, ants don't eat plants. What are you talking about? But this well, is happening over and over and over again. I don't know what kind of ants they are. Um, I'm think I'm actually thinking this might be in my research future. So I'll be going out with what I'm going to say. So the thing that's interesting about ants is that some of them love sugar and some of them love protein. Right. So that's what, we, what we'll do is we'll put out sugar traps and we'll put out hot dog traps. So we'll poison some hot dogs, we'll poison <laughs> some sugar, see who comes to it and find out who's causing the problem. I don't know enough about ants to be able to identify them from a picture, but I'd love to see a picture of what you're talking about. If you yeah, can. if I have trouble again, uh, I will send you a picture. Well, good news for entomologists is almost always bad news for other people. So right. I apologize, but I'd love to see a picture. <laughs> sure thing. <laughs> There's a um, no, couple more questions in the chat. Um, somebody saying, what can you do to prevent tomato hornworms? Um, does using marigolds next to it work? I would say no. Um, so tomato hornworms are laid by big honking nighttime flying moths. So what I find absolutely fascinating is our high tunnel growers will put like um, hardware cloth on the side of their of their tunnels. And that's like that big hardware cloth, like the holes are that big and that's big enough to keep out those um, hawk moths is what we call the adults. Um, so it's hard to keep those night flying moths off your plant using um, odors, right? It's really, really hard to maintain um, a biologically relevant odor for a really long time outside, especially at night when it's cool out. So probably not. Um, maybe netting might be something to think about if you can think about that. Another thing to think about, this is another wacky one, is those larvae, um, they, will, <laughs> they will fluoresce in black light. So you could go out at, here I am, I'm trying to get you guys to go out at night with your black light and I don't know, your doobies or whatever, and you can go and look for these worms and it's best to find them when they're little. So like when they're hatched, they're little tiny, tiny worms. So if you find them using your black light and, and pull them off, actually, I recently purchased a very special black light for this. And with the purchase of the black light came a pair of tongs that were about this big. So that's what they were recommending you do is go out with your flashlight and your big tongs and flick the, the worms off. So depending on how much space you're trying to go, how willing you're, you are to go out at night with your black light, um, that would be something to think about doing, especially like earlier in the season. So if you're used to seeing the big honkers who have you know pooped their square poops and eaten half of your plants like in August, try to take a look for those in July to get them when they're little. Um, the BT toxin, so like the Dipel product, is really effective on hornworms, but only on the little ones. So if you apply BT once they get big, they just can't eat enough. So if you remember the BT is a, is a gut poison, they have to eat it, it makes them sick and they die. The little ones can't handle it, the big ones, they laugh at it. So again, finding out that that is infested earlier, the better. Is that helpful? Does that answer your question? <laughs> I, 
There's another question here. Um, she says, I bought some oriental lilies last year and found out that they were treated with a systemic pesticide. When they grow this year, will they be pesticide free? I don't know. Um, the most commonly used um, systemic pesticide is something that is more than likely to exist in the soil for a little while. Um, the amount of material that's going to be taken up by the plant is going to be negligible um, by the second, the second year around, um, but that material is known just to stay in that soil for a really, really long time. So it's possible that a year later there's going to be material in the soil, um, but when you're talking about a negligible amount, it's like in the parts per billion. So yes and no, depending on how, how you think about it. So does that answer your question? up here. Um, somebody say, or uh, Beth says, amazing world out there, all these cool bugs. Um, another one asks how to get rid of squash bugs and those that eat the stem. Would that be this, uh, you know, squash beetles? So squash bugs um, are, are hmm, how do I, <laughs> they're very difficult, right? And I think the only thing I can really recommend is probably hand removal. But another thing that's really kind of um, interesting about squash bugs is that they love hiding underneath stuff. Right, so where the cucumber beetles are coming out at night and doing their business, squash bugs are daytime active. So if you want to hand pick squash bugs, you're going to be out there during the day, you're going to be looking underneath leaves, you're going to be looking for those like little hard football shaped eggs, and those are really hard to squish. So that's when I go out with like your jug of soapy water and kind of get those eggs into the soapy water to kill them. But at night, if you put like planks of wood down, they like to go under the planks of wood. So if you don't want to go out and hand pick and, and spend all that time, you can put planks of wood out and in the morning lift it up and then you can start scooping those up and putting them into soapy water. That's kind of gross. I don't know if that's helpful or not. <laughs> Says, I'm sticking to my guns this year and not doing any cleaning out of my garden until the end of May in order to preserve the pollinators. Is that useful? Which pollinators do we have in our area? Am I breeding pests? Um, I, <laughs> well, your answer is, um, it depends. <laughs> <laughs> so there are tons and tons and tons of pollinator species that will um, overwinter in the, the duff is what you're calling like so like there's there's little insects that have made sing, like solitary nests so the way that solitary wasps or solitary bees work is that they'll go and they'll gather either pollen or maybe even some kind of prey item so like another insect and they'll bring it back to their nest which is maybe a hole in the ground it might be the stem of a plant like raspberry plants brambles are awesome habitat for those solitary wasps and bees. They'll stick that pollen ball, lay an egg on it, um, and then cap that cell and they'll go and do that over again. So that's how like a solitary wasp kind of makes her nest. And those are the overwintering habitats. So if you're letting that area chill out, that's gonna save those species. I can't tell you what's living in your backyard, but there's tons and tons of different species. I would say hundreds of species that could be living in your backyard. So um, I do have a student who's coming on right now and he is very interested in looking into the different habitats. I know people are super into bee hotels. We often say like, you know, like, the stuff that's in your backyard and the raspberry is like the, the original bee hotel, but um, we're looking at, at, at being able to characterize those and provide everybody with more education as to how to identify these, these species on the wing and, and identify species that are unique to New Hampshire backyards. So stay tuned for that. But I think, yeah, I, I think that's a great thing to think about. Um, just like leaving that area cool. I don't think you're gonna be breeding any pests by doing that. I can't think of any, any reason off the top of my head not to, that would cause problems. Um, one thing I will say, especially if you are 
kind of leaving part of your yard as being wild if it's maybe a mouse or a, a, a small mammal habitat that might be something to consider especially if you're really concerned about ticks so my advice to you if you're going to leave part of your yard as wild brambly whatever maybe think about having some kind of buffer zone between the space that you use and that wild space so maybe like a yard or so of mulch or rocks or, or some kind of indication that says don't go over there unless you're wearing your tick pants you know unless you're wearing your your, your protective pyrethrin treated tick pants just to keep yourself from, from being exposed to tick habitat. Is that helpful? <laughs> yes, helpful. <laughs> Does anyone else, it's getting late, does anyone else have any questions they want to unmute themselves to ask or type in? I'm happy to quick read it. For Anna, and as Anna said, she ha you can, can keep asking questions, right, Anna? You yes, please. You, you've got my email. Please send it around. But also answers at unh.edu. That is the go-to. That's our ed center. They'll get right back to you. They also have some really terrific programming. If you are into like Facebook Lives, they do a lot of these, um, like uh, Granite State Gardener. It's a must listen if you're into gardening. That's some really, really helpful stuff. So. Thank you so much. Um, right. we, we will, this, there will be a copy of this on our website eventually, so within the next week, <laughs> so you can watch this. Terrific. Well, y'all have a great one, and hey, get out there and have a great season, right? <laughs>